Jimmy Carr, welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, very well indeed. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much for reaching out. It's very, uh, it's, it's a nice thing, I think, sometimes the internet. Someone reaches out and, and uh, name checks someone that you admire and you end up doing a podcast with them. Bloody perfect. You're terribly funny. Um, yes, I am. You are terribly funny. Thank you. But your tour, Terribly Funny, is well underway right now. You were in Austria, Hungary, last night Cardiff. Yeah, I had, a, I had a hell of a week. I had a week where I was, I kicked off in, I did South Africa. So I did one night in South Africa, two shows. So I flew into Cape Town, did, uh, no, flew into Joburg, did uh, Pretoria, and then went down to Cape Town and just flew out after the gig. And then I went to Paris to see a band. And then I went to Istanbul, then I went to Bucharest, uh, no, Budapest, not Bucharest, don't make that mistake, and then Vienna. I think Cardiff last night. Yeah, it's been it's been a hell of a week. Mm-hmm. But I kind of love that thing about. I, my theory is I don't think people want more time. People think they want more time. They don't. They want more unique experiences. People want more memories. So in life, I think doing things that are unique and and different is a really sort of good rule of thumb. If you if you get an offer, always go for the thing where you could have more luck. It's what it's George this, Max theory. It's, good it's theory. what this podcast was born out of during COVID. Our novelty and our intensity was stripped away from us. We were having the same routines, going the same walk, eating in the same places. Uh, there's a gift to that, though, isn't there? There's a, there's a great book by, uh, I think it's Milan Kundra, called Slowness. And in the book, he posits a theory that memory and speed are inversely proportionate. So it's that great line by Chairman Mao. It's, I mean, an ocean going cunt. But he was right about this. You can't smell the roses from a galloping horse. So sometimes life, you're moving at such a pace that you can't kind of slow down and, and, and take a moment. And that's a, it's a really sort of valuable thing. So that thing of like, you know, lockdown was we, ha- we made no new memories because we had the same day and the same day and the same day again and again and again. And you want to kind of vary things a bit in life, which is, which is great. I mean, I do the same thing every night. I tell jokes, but it's different. You're in a different place, different audience, different, you know, state of mind. Do you think that's why you enjoy doing so many different podcasts as well? Because you have different conversations surrounding the same themes. I think that's why I like different people. I think we're, we're um, incredibly egotistical individuals. And I think the reason we love other people is because we like who we are when we're with them. I think when I think about my uh, friendships, and we don't spend, uh, people spend a lot of time thinking about romance and not enough thinking about friendships. Friendships are so important in life. And when you think about who your best friends are, well, it's the people you have the least filter with. Mm. And that's a choice you make. And as a comedian, you make a choice to stand up in front of a thousand people and go, oh, I won't have a filter. I'll just say shit I think is funny and I'll treat you as if you're really good friends. And there's a lovely intimacy to that. that I love that quote, that laughter is the shortest distance between two people. It's a Victor Borg quote, I think. But isn't that a lovely thought that you kind of laugh together and you go, oh, all the barriers are down. We're just being, we're just being open here. I've heard you quote that and I love it. And I think the second closest distance between two people is an origin story. I read your book uh, recently. And one thing I love about it is that it is not only an autobiography, but also a set of lessons for life. It's very self-helping. I mean, I think that thing of the publisher de- wanted a celebrity uh, biography. But the problem with celebrity biographies, they're quite boring. And they're very um, middle class. Um, I-, I know how I present, but I'm a first generation Irish immigrant. So I'm quite working class in my, in how, in, in my character and what I know about myself. My reputation is what the rest of the world think of me. And they think I'm fancy and went to public school or some bullshit. Um, But that thing of going, um, you, the, 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 in the book, it's like, you don't want to just talk about how you did it because it's, it's not, there's nothing, that doesn't grow corn. That, oh, I'm a genius and I did this thing and it was really, uh, and then I had a lucky break and then another lucky break and it was great. You want something that people could take away and use. So when I sort of sat down to write the book and that, that's the stuff that's always inspired me. The kind of, um, and the self-help thing, I love self-help books. I really like that. But they are a bit po-faced. So there's a sense in which you kind of want, I think podcasts are really great at this kind of teasing out that same material and making it slightly more palatable, sugaring the pill with conversation. That's why I loved your book, because of I've consumed the Jordan Petersons of the world, the Nir Eyal's, the very theoretically heavy books. But hearing self-development theories and practices and frameworks through a voice that I admire and relate to. It made it more palatable and digestible. Very nice. Very nice to hear. I mean, really, all self-help, right? If we're going to boil it down, if someone's not got the time to read the book or any self-help book because they're getting on with life, um, prioritize later, right? That's the whole thing on self-help and not just self-help. That's the whole thing on religion. 
all religion, right? Religion, God, is a proxy for the future, right? Work hard now for a better future. That's the whole thing. Work, in a sense, is like God. Work is, well, you do, you do it now, so a better future. So it's that thing of like, I've been chatting to Chris Williamson. A lot. You know, Chris yeah, that yeah. does modern wisdom. I love Chris. He's amazing. I mean, George Mack are good friends of mine and very interesting conversations. And we're talking about that thing of like, we all have to serve someone, right? Everyone has to serve. So who are you going to serve? Well, if you're going to be selfish about it, serve yourself, but 24 hours in the future. What could you do today that you tomorrow would be glad you did? It's a great way to live because you think about what you eat, what you drink, who you spend time with. It all, like tomorrow when you wake up, oh, God, I had a good day yesterday. Great. And then you repeat. And it's just 24 hours ahead. But there's something, there might be a book in that. It's, a, it's an interesting concept to go living, because living five years in the future, like we don't, we don't rise to our goals. We fall to our systems. You know, so those systems, those habits, those everyday things, it's what life is. And finding joy in those systems and those processes opposed to attaching your self-worth to a goal or an outcome and just... Well, the goals and outcomes are, you know, it's that, that you're exactly right. It's that thing of the, the locus of control has to be within you. So if you're process-driven and you practice gratitude, it's much easier to, to enjoy what you're doing. You know, but it is that, you know, it's the classic, you'll know the quote, um, find something you know, you love doing, uh, you find something that's, it looks like work to them, but feels like play to you. So for me, that was, that was stand up. That was the, the idea that you could, I could do that for 16 hours a day and not really feel it because that's, that's my, that's my thing. That's my, that's where I find joy. I think it's, um, I think it's a, it's a teachable thing. I think a lot more people should be trying stand up. I think, I think it's very much the beginning of stand up. Like it really, you could trace it back. You could say Richard Pryor and George Carlin started this thing in the early 70s. Obviously, you can trace it way beyond that. And there's great comedians from before that. But they, they were not doing hour and a half shows on stage in theaters, touring around. It wasn't, they weren't on the same treadmill that, that I'm on. They, 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 they kind of uh, macheted their way through the jungle and left a path for the rest of us to kind of follow. They're incredible, incredible kind of, um, they're John the Baptist. Jesus ain't here yet. So it's a new medium, and I think it should be taught, because I think most people at schools like they, <clears throat> they might do sports, they might do music, and they're useful. But if you teach stand-up comedy in schools, right, what, what does it teach you? Well, it teaches you to write down and order your thoughts. It's pretty important. It teaches you to sort of find your voice and to be able to communicate with other people, and sort of a little bit of public speaking. And it teaches you to change your perspective, like to, to be able to recognize patterns and to change your perspective on life. Those are incredibly valuable skills in life. I mean, the tragedy is most people live and die and they never hear their own voice. And on stand-up comedy and the mechanistics of it, the feedback loop is so instant, unlike any other medium. Much like skateboarding, I think skateboarders and comedians have so much in common, is that the pain from rejection or failing is so instant that it almost throws you into trying again. You make friends with failure. You know, failure is like, failure is a superpower. <laughs> Just being okay with failing time and time again. Like I, I've written so many more jokes that don't work than you have. <coughs> You're right, most of my jokes do work. <laughs> he, this, guy's, this guy did a spit take on that. No, Jimmy, shut up. Everything you say is funny. Correct. Another benefit to learning stand-up is that it gives you power as well. Usually those who are the class clowns, especially in schools, I, I really think the, the joke is more more violent than the punch because if I were to punch you in a classroom yeah you'd have instant pain but people would run over to help you however my reputation for punching in the face would be tarnished for a very long time however if I mock you through an insult not only do you look bad and your reputation is diminished based on what funny thing I had to say my status actually elevates so I think there's a lot of power in being the class clown yeah I would agree with that to a point but I don't view jokes as punches. Mm. I kind of think the whole concept of punching down is some nonsense. Because really, when you pick that apart just a little bit, it's suggesting people are below me. Yeah. Really? Really? That's, that's, you think people are below me? I can't joke about them because they're below me. Mm. Fuck you very much. That's some crazy thinking to think that people can't take a joke. I think there's something about sharing a joke that's very... Um, it's very egalitarian. Like I like to think of myself as an as a equal opportunities a, a offender. I find everyone and that we're all in this together. There's no sacred cows. 
we're all fine. We can all take a joke. And you often see that the audience is part of the performance too, right? Of course, yeah. Being in an audience is incredibly performative. I think people maybe see it more at rock and roll shows because at a rock and roll show, you know, if, you, if you're not standing there fist in the air, clapping along, doing the whole, it, you feel like you're a tool. But that's a performance. You're doing, you don't do that when you listen to it in the car. <laughs> I think it's the same thing with comedy where you can watch it on, you know, the new Netflix special and you can th- oh, and watch it on the bus and think, oh, it's really funny. I like those jokes. You don't laugh in the same way. You don't release endorphins in the same way. It's quite a performative, social, tribal thing. And I think people are crying out for that. I think people really want that in their lives. And the process of you writing your autobiography, given the fact that you probably had to do so much self-examination, what benefits did that bring to your life and your psyche and the fabric of your mind? Well, I suppose you could, you could, you know, you can go back to the, the life unexamined is not worth living. Mm-hmm. You, you sort of take stock. I think it was in the lockdown. So it was that thing of like, I had options. You know, my manager called me and said, well, you can either write a book or start a podcast. And I took the dignified approach. <laughs> this, frankly, what the fuck is this? I took the easy um, road. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, um, it's a fun thing to do. I mean, I would really, uh, I'd recommend actually, you know, if you're, I, I, I imagine your audience, and I don't know, but I imagine your audience are a little bit younger. Yeah. And I think that thing about Jordan Peterson's got this thing. I like Jordan, Jordan a lot. There's kind of, there's a lot of kind of, oh, he's. Your podcast was great with him. Yeah. He's it's, it's, it's a really nice bloke. He's a mate. And, uh. There's a lot of talk about him being somehow a force for evil. What the fuck are you talking about? He wants the best for people. And that thing of he's got a self-authoring thing. I really recommend. It's really good. It's a course. It's like $200 or something. It's not nothing, but it's not nothing for a reason. Could have done it for nothing. It's like you'll you're put some work in, but you have to write your story. And it's really interesting, that idea of literally and metaphorically, we are self-authored. We are a story that we tell ourselves. And what story do you want to tell? And if you don't like the story as it is now, right, you can change that. And partly, you know, writing the book is about sort of going, well, I had a quarter life crisis. I was you know, 25, 26. And I had a good job. And the good is the enemy of the best. I wanted an interesting, fun adventure. Yo, ho, ho, a pirate's life for me. That's what I wanted. And that's what I, I took. And there's nothing special about me. Really, if there's any message in the book, if it's any different to your average sort of celeb biography, nothing special. There's no, there's no genius uh, in me. I mean, there's you know, genius as well as a, as a, it's a weird term. It gets overused, doesn't it? Because there's, there's two types. There's, there's genuine genius, Bach and von Neumann, you know, geniuses. And then there's hyper-accelerated rationality. Not quite the same. But it's, you know, that's all I've got. This podcast aims to use origin stories as a self-development tool to showcase essentially a library of digital role models. People might look from the outside in and hear your accent, see how you're dressed and perceive you as this upwardsly middle class, polished man, which you are now. But it was never always that. You went on a trajectory to get to that point through both your education, but also your first big decision. Can we go back in time and analyse or bring to life what the raw components of Jimmy Carr's Genesis story were. So yeah, I, so um, Irish Catholic immigrant parents from Limerick, uh, and they moved to Slough. So from Limerick to Slough. So they 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 liked a shit town. <laughs> it's very much their thing. We like shit towns. So they moved uh, there, and we, I grew up in the uh, in the shadow of the Miles factory on the Farnham Road in Slough. That's kind of my first uh, memory. I think we were in Isleworth before that. But the, yeah, anyway, Slough. And it was, uh, it was nice, you know, I, I, a nice enough childhood. And I think the thing that I'm very conscious of that didn't exist back then is there was no, um, there was very little mimetic desire. So that kind of, um, I'm sure you're familiar, uh, the René Girard, that French philosopher, you know, this theory of mimetic desire. So we've got real desires, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're horny, da, 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 all that. And then we've got other, what other people have. And the idea that we want what other people have. So that hedonic treadmill of whatever you've got, you're kind of constantly looking. You get used to what you have and you want more, you want more, you want more. And actually my childhood was very, I didn't really know people that went on foreign holidays or went skiing or um, went traveling. I I wasn't exposed to that. Everyone was sort of in the same boat and there was a lovely, it was very nice. I feel slightly bad for kids now that are constantly looking at Instagram at people having a better life than, or even people looking at their own lives and going, this looks, I'm always happy in this but in the real world, because Instagram is a highlights reel and life is a bloopers reel. Anyway, so childhood, I wasn't the brightest, very dyslexic. 
uh, as a as a child, so couldn't read really with any level of um, competence until I was about eleven. And I still I'd be very embarrassed now to show you my handwriting. I've got quite bad handwriting and penmanship, and um, I find it embarrassing. And so I think partly the drive to to get to Cambridge was to prove something to myself and to make my mother proud. I wanted to be, I wanted, I wanted a different narrative. And then I switched schools when I was 16. And that really was the, I didn't know it at the time, but that was so great because you, you found that you were able to kind of rewrite who you were. Like if you speak to people that went to school with me when I was, you know, 16, it's like, oh, he's a terror way. He's not going to do anything. And then when I was 17, I was at this other school and I kind of reinvented myself as, oh, yeah, I'm pretty academic. Yeah. And that was a really interesting kind of switch of like, you can't beat your environment. And sometimes it's like, you don't want the thing from the past, so you have to change it up. What are your opinions on the schooling system? Is it designed to churn out the class clowns into professional comedians? Uh, well, certainly not. I mean, I think, I think there's a weird thing where there's a gender imbalance in my business, which I don't like. I think there should be more female comics. Uh, and I think it's because of the incentives. Right. So if you're the funny guy in school, there's a reward for that. There's status that comes with that. If you're the funny girl, there's a it's changing, but it's changing too slowly for me. There seems like there's more status given to funny young guys. And obviously a, a tiny percentage of those become professional comedians. And there's less status conferred on the girls. And that kind of the grassroots changing that. And that's why I think, again, it should be taught in schools, because actually I think that's where you've got a that's where the problem lies early on that we're not rewarding that. But we all know from our lives, men and women, there's no difference in who's funny. Moving on to you entering Cambridge for the first time as a working class dyslexic young man. Did you feel like you fit in there? Did you? No, but no one feels like they fit in there and it's good. Why? It, well, because imposter syndrome's good. People talk about imposter syndrome, like, oh, I don't feel comfortable. I'm out of my comfort zone. I don't know if I belong here. And then you don't. So then you work really hard because you don't feel like you're enough. And then you do. Okay, well, that system seems to work. You should be out of your comfort zone every 18 months. As you level up at every stage of your career, you should feel like you're out of your comfort zone. So I'm like, I'm playing arenas next year. I've no need to play arenas. Why am I doing it? Well, because I want to feel uncomfortable. I want to put on a show in an arena for 12,000 people that's fucking great. And that's a tall order. That's a difficult thing. It's much easier for me to go, well, I'll just do, you know, two, 3,000 seaters and, and do multiples. But I've done that before. So I'm going to try something new. I'm writing a book now about teaching jokes and, and uh, with my friend Amanda and, and trying to share what I know and trying to be. And that's, that's a big step up. That's a big thing of going, oh, I'm so good at this. I'm going to teach other people. But that, it's for me, not for them, right? It's that, it's that thing where you go, I get told something, I forget it. I read something, I remember it. I teach something, I know it. I want to teach. I want to share that because it's, it's been an incredible gift to me. And I think it's a transferable skill set. And I think also, I just want more people to give it a go. It's not like, it's that thing, I didn't know what the Edinburgh Festival was until I was in my uh, maybe early 20s. I, I'd, no, I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. Actually, no, it was later than that maybe 25, like I got into comedy, I was going to a lot of comedy just before I, I got into being a comedian and people talked about the Edinburgh Festival. And I went, well, who's that for? <laughs> who's it for? It must be for posher kids than me. It must be for, and someone at college took a play up there. And I was going, well, what? what do you mean you're taking a play to Edinburgh and you're raising money to do that? Why would you be taking a play to Edinburgh? I'm like, okay, we're going to Spain to sit on a beach. Like, I didn't know what it was. And I feel like that's, that's, I don't know what the, I don't know how you communicate that, but I think like if I was, if, if there's young people listening that are 18, 19 and they're thinking about spending, getting a summer job and saving up and going to Ibiza for two weeks, don't fucking bother. Go to Edinburgh for two weeks. <laughs> That's where the fun's happening. What do you want from a holiday? Fun. Fun. Fun's what you want. Where are they making fun? Edinburgh. Uh, Ibiza, you might have fun when you're there. Whatever, it's going to be sun. Stay out the sun. You save a 40, 90% of aging is sun damage. Stay out the sun. I'm ginger, I can't. You're, fucking, you're, you're basically an x-ray of a normal human. <laughs> you look as if you get sunburnt open in the fridge. <laughs> Don't take a photo with me of the flash on. Yeah, factor 50 just to check your iPhone. Anyway, <laughs> the, 
but that thing of like going Edinburgh is really fun and really good, but but working class kids don't go there. Like you know, kids from Slough don't go there. Um, so it's that, it's that thing. I mean, my my view on education is it should be free. It, it should be difficult to get into university, and some people won't make it, and that's elitist. It should be elitist. It's fucking university. We should educate everyone well to the age of eighteen. Great. That should be a level playing field, and whoever does best in standardized testing should get into university. It, it should be, I mean, the first step would be free for STEM, but it was free when I went, free. Sure, you had to pay for your accommodation or whatever, so you had to have a little bit of wherewithal behind you, but, but free, the education was free. That's how it should be, because it's a better economy, right? That's better for everyone if it's free. So no bullshit subjects. We'd start with STEM and build out from there, and then make it free for everyone. And don't tell me we can't afford it, because that's just some fucking nonsense. We have it free up in Scotland, and that's affording my sister and many of my friends through the uh, upward social mobility journey, which is fantastic. Well, your, your, your sister slipped through the cracks. That, that, that's an error. That's an error. That's a waste of a place. But that's, that's uh, we've only, I've only met her briefly, but I made, I made a value judgment. I, yeah. What did you get a degree in? International business. International business. Yeah, you see? Worldwide. Yeah, but well, no one's no one's no one's doing a deal with a cartel without that kind of qualification. <laughs> if you're going to bring in weight to Glasgow, mm -hmm. you're going to need that. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, on imposter syndrome, Seth Coulson, when he came on the show, taught me about how we should be rephrasing it less as of a, sim a syndrome and more of a superpower. You should be saying thank you when it shows up because it shows you or indicates to you that you're putting something into existence that already doesn't exist. And that could be your edge, the thing that you talk about, your edge. I think if you are truly pursuing that innate ikigai or that innate purpose or that innate edge, you should be feeling that sense of imposter syndrome because no one's ever done it. No one's taking your ideas and put it into a physical manifestation. Um, so when he taught me that on the show, it was like a, almost like a unlocking with this podcast because I had a lot of self, self doubt with the podcast. It's a lovely way of reframing, I think. The idea of going, I don't know. I think comfort is slightly overrated, isn't it? Nothing great was born in comfort. No, you, you can't have an easy life and a great character. You just can't. Point me to someone who had an easy life. Mm, okay. And, that, and here's the thing. Life is self-assignment. I mean, it isn't beyond a certain point. Like, school isn't self-assignment and university isn't self-assignment. So you go there and you're very kind of causative because you, you, you kind of go, well, they tell you exactly what you need to do. And then suddenly you're out in the world and some people have got maps and some people don't. So if you want to become, I don't know, a doctor or a lawyer or put a man on Mars, there, there's, there's a map for those things. We sort of know, but, you know, this is a terrible thing about life. Life is very complex, like com I, rather complicated, right? Putting a man on the moon is very complicated. There's a million different steps, but it's just one step after the other, right? Complex problems, who's going to win the sports game? Impossible to predict. And how to live your life is like a complex problem. So it's, it's uh, you want to give people agency, you want to give them, um, I mean, you know, if I rule the world, I think that, you know, free education would be um, sort of top of the list because that thing of like social mobility is incredibly valuable and it's not happening enough. You did the path that was well trodden after Cambridge, you took a graduate job or a management fast track scheme. Yeah, I did, yeah. I've, and uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, listen, I'm not being... I don't want to be sneery about that either. A lot of people get jobs like nine to fives and that's their thing. And they're especially like doctors and lawyers or whatever. It's like, yeah, you work for a big organization and you can do very well in that and you can absolutely be, um, you know, creative and um, get, you know, self-satisfaction from, from doing all that. I went a different way. It wasn't right for me, but it's, it's right for some people. How or when did you decide to make a significant change? Was there an indicator that you were... I don't think there was. I mean, it's, it's that weird thing with... Uh, you sort of can't fake bravery because if you did it, then you were brave. But fucking hell, it's scary. You know, it, to leave and to go, well, I'm going to just go out into the world and, and be a stand-up comedian. And you, you've kind of... You haven't done it yet. You haven't... You know, I always think that thing about, you know, you have to give the world irrefutable evidence you are who you say you are. And I hadn't. I'd, you know, I'd done a couple of little shows and things, but it wasn't like... Uh, it wasn't like a um, an unbelievable talent that needed to be. It was it's something I worked incredibly hard at. But I knew as soon as I saw it, as soon as I saw that glimmer of oh, that stand up is a job, I knew I had to work for that. I knew I'd had to I'd have to put the hours in. 
and you essentially quit Shell. You took voluntary redundancy. Yeah, I mean that was just uh, lucky timing that they were trying to get rid of some dead weight in the company. And actually, one of the, uh, but it applied. They had to legally they had to give it to everyone. So I took it, and you know they paid me a you know, proportion of your salary, and you you know I had like a had like a year's money, I guess, I, 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 I think it was like five grand, but I had, that was enough to live for a year because it's, you know, how much money do you need? It's the, when, when you're doing something that you love, it's, it becomes unimportant. You get out of that, and I remember Fight Club coming out and, and really that really resonating with me. The idea that we spend our lives buying shit we don't need to impress people we don't like. And you, yeah, you, but even now I sort of think that. I mean, I, I buy a lot of crazy shit, but... There's nothing you can buy in the shopping mall you would give a fuck about in five years' time. One of the insights I love from your friend Chris Williamson is the region beta paradox. Have you heard him speak about that with Rory? No, go on. What's... Essentially, the concept whereby if things are worse, they can only get better. So um, if your relationship with your partner is she's cheating on you, she's hitting on you, swearing at you, you're more likely to make a radical change and leave that relationship. Yes. But if things are quite well, comfortable... This is, this is the... Yeah, I mean, I've got that in the book. The, the good is the enemy of the best. It's that thing of, like, comfort and a comfortable life. But again, what do you... What do you what, you've got to... It's self-assignment. You've got to give yourself an adventure. You've got to go and do something. So I'm, I'm a big fan of... Uh, a big fan of Im immigration. Immigrants generally are the best people because they're high agency. You know, and that kind of thing of like they've given themselves the time. They're like they're sitting there wherever they're from, you know, Limerick with my folks or whatever, and going shit around here. Let's go. Let's go somewhere else. That takes some. That's that's really to be admired. It's an incredible thing. Do you think that's what kind of propelled your career in comedy? The fact that you had no other choice but to make it. I heard through a friend that you, for one of your first gigs, you phoned a, a guy called Jeff Waiting and asked him can I get on your, your bill? And he said, no. And you, you showed up anyway, wearing the suit and said, well, I suppose I'm here now. Can I do five minutes? Hmm. And he said, yes. No, I didn't do that. Uh, I did that with everyone. I turned up everywhere. I just turned up. I didn't call. Turn up at the gig. I'm a comedian. Can I get on? And more often than not, yeah, do five minutes. You're here. Great. So it's that thing of like, you, you, you turn up, you're, you know, good or good, uh, good enough, you know, joke shape things. And uh, yeah, it was, yeah, you know, I was kind of, um, I was very ambitious and driven and I, I just kind of, I, I loved it. So it wasn't work to me. So I went out, I think it was like 300 times a year. Um, yeah. And even then I kind of think, well, you know, what was I doing the other nights? <laughs> well, a bit like I did 300 shows last year. I can still do it. I can still, um, you know, put that and, and really reps in the gym. What else is there? I'm fairly stoic about it now. I try and be quite stoic. Do do less better. Just seems like a really good once you find it, specialize. Obviously, you know, early twenties, whatever. I don't know what age what, what, what the cutoff point is. It's different for different people. But that idea of going, well, look, you wanna you wanna find what you're good at. Once you find it, edge. Just what could you do better than anything else? You don't have to be the best in the world. Just what could you do better than anything else? Put everything into that. I love a quote in your book that's there's two great myths, talent and luck. Well, I, I think, yeah, I think it's talent and hard work. Is the, Sorry, talent so and hard work. It's that thing where you go, the, you know, the, the people think Michael Jordan, oh, he's the most talented, he's this tall, he's really athletic. He could never, there's lots of guys with the same physicality of him, not lots, there's a few. And they didn't all make it because they didn't all turn up to practice. He turned up to practice and the work ethic, I mean, when we watch The Last Dance, you see the work ethic and the talent, <sighs> amazing. But people see... And they go, well, he's lucky. Yeah, and he, he is lucky, right? He's lucky that basketball's even a thing, right? He's lucky he wasn't born 100 years ago. He's lucky, you know, lucky in so many ways. And then you look at someone like uh, Bill Gates, and people don't see the luck in the same way. They don't see, oh, he was born with an IQ of 170 and a work ethic. And the work ethic of Michael Jordan and Bill Gates, it's, it's heritable, that work ethic, to a large degree. So when we see luck in, I, I think luck, say, luck and gratitude, uh, you know, seeing seeing luck as a, um, you know, you can kind of make your own luck in terms of turning up at every gig, 300 shows a year for the first five years, just, you know, being there that much. I got lucky. Why? I was there. I was, I was in the right place. Where were you? Everywhere. When? All the time. Okay. I, love I, that. I guess that thing is, well, it, it, um, it deals with the other problem of success, which is success engenders envy and jealousy. And the best way to deal with that is allow people to know 
how hard you worked. Because people want what I have. They don't want to do what I had to do to get it. They don't want this pathology. What's the difference between envy and jealousy? Well, I think they're conflated words. I think, and it doesn't it doesn't matter which way around you use it, whatever works for you. But for me, uh, jealousy is about not wanting someone else to have something. And that's very poisonous. Like, why have they got that? I'm, 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 you, do you want that or do you not want that? You, you, you know, you, you're agnostic towards it in terms of what you want, but it, like, you don't want them to have it, right? They, that's, a, that's a horrible emotion. Envy, I think, can be very useful because envy could tell you what you want. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's kind of the crucial question in life. What do you want? That, that, I, for me, wishing wells work, but they work way before you think they work. There's no magic fairy granting your wish, but knowing what to wish for when you toss the coin in. Ah, that's the thing. What do you wish for? What do you, you know, on, on, you're on the spot and you go, what, what, what do you want? And you, you sometimes you, you just let your subconscious throws out something. Oh, yeah, I want that. Great. Once you know what you want, I think getting it is comparatively easy. The problem is if you don't know what you want in life. If you don't know where you're going, no wind is favorable. Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> when did you truly discover what you wanted to want? What you wanted to want. I mean, I think the, um, I think it changes over time. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't believe in an afterlife, but I believe in a next life. And I think we have these, you know, stages that we go through. And I think I'm, uh, I think at, at one stage it's, it's, uh, it's fame and fortune that you want because fame and fortune in a secular world have replaced heaven. That's the land of milk and honey that people go, well, if I was rich and famous and on Love Island, I would be, I would be happy and contented forever. And, uh, and it is good. I, I do like it. Um, but then other things, you know, priorities change over time. And I think now, you know, from a career point of view, I just want to be better. I, just, I feel like I'm getting better at stand-up comedy. The more I put into it, the more I get. I think there was a couple of years there where I was, you know, I was very busy doing a million TV shows and, and uh, I allowed myself to get a little bit distracted. And I think refocusing and getting better at joke writing and actually the the experience of writing this book. So the first book, the, the biography Before and After, I had some help from my friend Amanda Baker. And then we're working together on this next book about comedy and teaching. And I think through doing that, I've kind of rediscovered this, okay, I need to focus on this. Um, and then you, you become a parent, you become a father. It's a, it's, it's a, becoming a father really is... Think about what it does functionally. It's like standing in nature. It's you, you're in awe. You feel very small because you're part of this kind of cycle of life. You're, 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 you become a, a dad and you kind of go, right, okay, I've got to take care of this thing. And it's, it's bigger than me. It's more important than me. And that's a, that's a lovely, that's a, that's a lovely recalibration because you're no longer the, the main character in your own life. Do you choose your sense of humor? I, I don't think I did. I think I probably would have been a storyteller had I got to choose. Because then you've got, what, five funny stories in an hour? Fucking what? Work shy. I have to write 300 jokes to fill an hour. Do you think the, difficult. Do you think the average person, the listener, do you think they choose their sense of humor? Mm. No, I think it's pretty... Um, no, because I think people aspire to liking stuff that they maybe don't like. I think sometimes there's like, uh, you know, if you if you like I don't know, dumb scatological stuff, it's, if that's what really makes you laugh, eh, that's what really makes you laugh. It's very exposing a sense of humor because it's um, your conscious kind of turns up late to the party. It's one of my favorite noises at a comedy <laughs> gig where you get cognitive dissonance, where people laugh at a joke about a terrible thing. And then they go, oh, we shouldn't laugh at that. But they've already, they're already laughing as they're, that's terrible. It's a, it's a lovely, I don't know, it's, it's, it's nice to kind of play with people. And it's, it's a real sign of intelligence that I think to have those two thoughts at the same time. Well, we shouldn't be laughing at that, but that is very funny. I think you can also tell a lot about a person based on what they laugh at as well, or what they've been through perhaps. Well, um, growing Don up, like here's, I had here's an insight. Here's something for you. Donald Trump, you've never seen him laugh. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> He's a full-on narcissist. Holy shit. You've never seen him laugh. Never. This is the problem with narcissists. As Neil Brennan, my very good friend, very wisely said, 
They have the disease, you have the symptoms. Yeah. yeah. I also believe that many people watch stand-up comedy in the same way that Jordan Peterson professes that people watch horrors to condition themselves for tragedy. I think some people watch stand-up comedy, especially the darker stuff like yours, to condition them for life almost. Yeah, it well, creates look, a look here's, here's, the, here's the truth of it. I feel very bad for the people that get offended. Right? Not in a patronizing way, but genuinely, right? I've got a very dark sense of humor. And the people that come and see me have got a very dark sense of humor. So we can laugh at stuff that's awful. So death, right? Who hasn't been affected by death? I mean, everyone, right? Grieving, disease, bad news, financial worries. You've got political chaos, terrible things happening, right? If you can laugh about those things, it, 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 it just makes the worst days just a little bit more livable. And it connects you to other people in those moments when you desperately need to connect. And uh, the people that get offended, they've just got to white knuckle that shit. It's a fucking terrifying thought. Just like even in depression and anxiety and, and, and hopelessness, you can find glimmers of humor and fun. And I, I mean, I'm trying to talk about that in the new show, actually. I'm, I'm talking a little bit about kind of mental health and suicide um, in the show and trying to make that funny which is, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important. It's good. One thing that's bonded my sister and I together through hardship, through losing my mum, was humour. When did you lose your mum? I was 21, uh, so during 2020. And when I... I let's take a moment. What was your mum called? Pauline. Pauline, yeah. Mine was Nora. I lost her when I was about 26. And I don't think I'm over it yet. I think it's, it's an amazing sort of, that thing of like, grief is the price we pay for love. And I, I, I get that. I get that it would be sad if it wasn't sad. But it's such a huge, I don't know what your relationship was like with your mother, but for me, I was so enmeshed, I was so close to my mother, I couldn't imagine anything worse than losing her. And then when you lose her, there is, the, the, the benefit that comes with it is a sense of freedom, yeah. is a sense of pushing the fuck it button and going, well, like you get mortality in a way that you didn't get before. Like Second-hand you, mortality. Like, like you get that thing of, what's the great... Um, uh, quote, we're, we're, we're between two eternities of darkness. And this is a little shaft of light. We die and we're the lucky ones because we get to live. There's, there's like, Mark Twain said it brilliantly. He said, uh, I, I, I wasn't alive for billions of years before my birth and it didn't inconvenience me in the least. People are always looking at that end of the telescope. Like, yeah, we die. That's terrible. So we weren't we weren't around before. This is <laughs> this is why life is so special. It's just this little shaft of light in the middle of it all. And you know your your mother's passing. I mean that's very young to lose your mum. It's it's also it's young and it's old. It's like you're a grown man, but you I mean you're not. You know no one's finished at twenty one. Christ. It propelled me into doing stand up. It's the exact reason I did a stand up comedy course and performed my first gig, which was all about the tragic loss of my mum. But I shed light on it. I put on these kind of rose-tinted comedic glasses that allowed me to process what seems to be such a tragic event, which it was, in such a new lens. Um, and yeah. being able to revisit and process the whole end-to-end -end journey through the lens of comedy helped me just get over it in general and accept it. And I'm not sure if perhaps humour and the shared laughter that you experienced with your mum helped you through grieving her as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, mean, I think really the... The question for comedians, if you ever have comedians on the show, is which of your parents were sick? They've always got a sick parent. They always had to kind of um, be the emotional thermostat in the house. Yeah. Or the vast majority of them had to kind of fulfill that role. Yeah, it's not, not an easy thing to, uh, to lose a parent. And, and yet kind of, you know, grief people don't really, I don't know. I don't think we talk about it en enough. I think uh, our society's kind of set up to hide it away. Um, we don't really, it's one of those things that religion does very well and the secular world does very badly, talking about death and, you know. Did you have people around you to support you through that journey? Like uh, friends and close connections? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was uh, not, not so much. It was a, it was a, it was a pretty, pretty tough time, uh, I would say. Uh, but I think that's also how much you let people in. I think that's about maybe that's a lesson learnt from that thing of like not letting people in 
and being quite sort of self-reliant in that, which is, I think, um, quite a quite a sort of masculine trait of like going, well, I'm just going to better just deal with this and crack on. Um, so I just I kind of worked through it. I found like the time on stage was very joyful. So I just got on stage more uh, as much as I possibly could, uh, which is probably not the most uh, healthy thing. Given you've transcended into TV and selling out shows worldwide, and your mum's not around to see or hear that, is there a missing chair or a missing person in one of the audience audience's chairs when you are at those gigs? Are you ever Sold out? That? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, it's, a, it's a lovely thought. To, um, I mean, you can really see when you have kids why there's religion. Because, you know, as soon as the dog dies, you have to sort of explain to the kid, ah, oh, uh, it's dead. It's not coming back. That's it. And it, it, the temptation to go, oh, it's in heaven now. And this, all dogs go to heaven and they, they get to play all day. But we can't see it. We can't visit. It's gone to live in the country. The kind of the bullshit story. Um, no, I think there's... Um, I, I like that thing of we die twice. We die when we die and the last time someone says our name. And it's why I asked your mum's name. Uh, it's nice to remember people and to, um, I don't know, you honour that in a way and you try and do, you know. There, there's a bit of me that sometimes when I'll, I'll do things and think, oh, she would, she would have liked this. She would have thought this was cool. And it's definitely not being in this podcast studio with me, that's for sure. <laughs> this is great, man. It's, it's a fun chat, isn't it? It's fun. One of the most memorable things, unfortunately, that I remember you for in my childhood was being publicly cancelled. Oh, yeah. Well, which time? I've had a few of those. <laughs> pick a, pick a favourite. I'll talk about any of them. Well, the one time that you were attempted to be cancelled for your personal life, not your professional life. Oh, well, the tax thing. The tax thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was... That How was... did you navigate that? That must have been so heavy it was, for you. I, well, it was heavy, but it was quite... There's a couple of things about cancellation. Firstly, I got cancelled. Mine was pretty easy mm -hmm. because we cannot forgive what we cannot punish, right? I got I got dragged for tax avoidance, right? So tax evasion, tax avoidance, you know the difference. Yep. 18 months in prison. <laughs> so I was on the right side of that, didn't do anything illegal, and then got called out by some fucking, I mean, Tory cunt um, for being morally abhorrent. I mean, fuck you, man. But that to one side, I'd fucked up. I fucked up. I'd, I'd, I'd done something that's, okay. So I just, I went, well, I'll pay it back. Super, super easy, right? But that, some people get cancelled over stuff and it's a bit more nuanced and difficult and, there's, and you can't ever forgive them. I paid the money back. It's, kind of, it's, it's good, right? Uh, and then it's a, it's a filter. Being cancelled is a filter. And you find out who your friends are. Yep. And that's very painful um, in a way. But you don't have to waste your life on the people that are fair weather friends. The people that are there in tough times, right, we're good, we're ride or die. And you don't get to find out until that shit happens. It's surprising. It's surprising the people that throw you under the bus and the people that are a little bit gleeful and, oh, he's been brought back to, down to, uh, yeah, okay, let's see, it's a long road. And then it makes you a better person. It makes you, getting cancelled, it makes you much more empathetic and it makes you much better at calling on the day. Always call on the day. If someone dies or a friend gets an abortion or I don't know, fucking the boyfriend leaves or something awkward happens and you become aware of it, call on the day. And call and go, I don't know what to say, but I wanted to be the person that called. What did that day one look like for you? What, being cancelled? It was pretty, uh, it was, it's interesting because it's the, it's the, falling feels like flying. You know, you're kind of, you're, whoa, this is, and then, I got kind of cancelled like I was bungee jumping, but I didn't know I was bungee jumping. So you're falling and, whoa, this is all fucked. I remember like going to record 8 Out of 10 Cats with, uh, with Sean and sort, of, um, and, and sort of saying, this might be my last time making a TV show. And Sean going, no, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. You're going to get a tough time, but it's going to be all right. And then, you know, getting rinsed by him, but like in a very good way. Uh, and then it was all fine. It was kind of, it was... Uh, very tough couple of days. But again, you can't have a great character in an easy life. You've got to go through a couple of things, right? How does that compare to being cancelled or attempt to be cancelled for your professional life, for the jokes that you tell? I, 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 try, I try not to engage. I try as best as I can to go, look, it's absolutely valid that people don't like some of my jokes. Jokes are like magnets. They attract some people 
and they repel other people. Some people are repelled by my sense of humor. They, 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 they do not like it, right? And they don't come to the shows and they don't watch the Netflix specials. But when the new Netflix drops, a clip will go up online and it'll show up in someone's feed and they'll watch it and go, well, this is ban this filth. This joke's so terrible, I've got to send it to everyone I fucking know. Okay. And, but you've got to right size that, right? I remember James Corden was very sweet last time I got canceled. He phoned me and went, what's happened? And I went, oh, yeah. And he went, no, 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 I'll tell you what's happened. You told a joke and some people didn't like it. That's it. That's it. Let's, let's, let's get lunch. And you're known publicly for telling dark jokes. You were centered and aligned. When you, when you told whatever joke it was that cancelled you, you were doing your job. You were doing the thing that you do. Yeah. You weren't maligned. Oh, it won't be the last time. It's, it's coming around again, I'm sure. But I think if you're going to, as soon as you start defending jokes, as soon as you start um, uh, apologizing, you're just in a world of pain. It's, I mean, I got, I got a plan. There's a bit on the new special where I talk about this um, uh, on, on Natural Born Killer. So say, look, you can't go around apologizing for jokes. They're jokes. So what I'm going to do the next time I get cancelled, next time I upset people with the joke, I'm going to say, on the day of the cancellation, the day the news story comes out, and I've rehearsed this, I'm going to say, I'm sorry. And the people that were offended will say, you don't really mean that apology. And I'll say, so you're saying I could say something and not mean it. Now you're getting it. <laughs> it's the, but it's true, right? It's a fucking joke. Because as soon as you defend it, it becomes a belief. Well, it's also, it's the, it's the uh, I mean, journalists. Have you ever spent time with journalists? No. no, no. Journalists are all right. They're a good, you want to go for a pint with a journalist. Pretty much any journalist I've ever met. I've gone, he seems all right. She seems all right. Fun people. They are. They're a fun bunch, right? They're writers. They're out there. They're, ha they're, they're fun. And then they have to write this. They know it's a joke. They know it's not a public statement. They know that they can see the irony. They're not dummies. They're intelligent people. They've got to fill a paper. So they, they look for two dummies on Twitter to go, oh, I didn't like that. Oh, we shouldn't joke about that. You can't, you can't joke about that. That's, te that's too terrible to make jokes about. Is it? The one thing that affects you is the bad thing, is it? All the other stuff, fine. Saying something's too terrible to joke about. It's like saying a disease is too terrible to treat. Well. Given the rise in cancel culture or perceived rise in cancel, cancel culture, has it changed the delivery and the style and the feel of modern day stand-up comedy in comparison to 30 years ago? I think ago? it has. I think we've got much better. I think, I think actually if you look at the basket of things you couldn't say 30 years ago and the basket of things you can't joke about now, i take the, the basket now. I don't think there's much you can't joke about now. I think this is a, it's an illusion. I think, I think it's really going... I mean, I'm... I don't, my tour's going great. I've got a Netflix special. It's what cancel culture? <laughs> what are we even talking about? You get dragged. And like, and I don't mind people criticizing the jokes. I'm pretty up for people going, yeah, I don't like it. I don't like that kind of sense of humor. Fine. But cancel culture is about trying to cancel the individual, not criticize the idea. Mm -hmm. So if you cancel, try and cancel the individual, and then if you say anyone that defends that individual, you're blackened by the same thing, that becomes a very different kind of crazy Maoist fucking bullshit. I'm not interested in that at all. Are you threatened at all by the introduction of AI and comedy? No, AI is a covers band, man. <laughs> I'm about as scared of AI as I am of China. It's a fucking covers band. They're fuck all. I'm serious. I like, it can, it can come up with something that's an Erzaltz, uh, Erzatz, uh, Jimmy Carr joke, right? So it can come up with something, but it really, when you when you pick it apart, it's like, oh, that's well, you've taken that joke and you've just changed the, the, the okay, I can see what you've done there. So I don't think it's it's artificial intelligence, not artificial consciousness. We're a long way from artificial consciousness. And if 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 computers can write jokes, fine. If they start laughing at jokes, that's consciousness. That's that's how we know we're humans. It's it's you know. It's how we know we're free. We must laugh because when we laugh, it's the first sign of freedom. What One of my favorite things to watch of yours is compilations of you responding to heckles. I see you as the goat or the greatest of all time when it comes to responding to heckles. You know what the story of goat is? No. You know who came up with the term greatest of all time? Muhammad Ali. Really? Yeah. Isn't that great? 
The fucking goat thought of it. <laughs> the goat came up with the term goat. It's fucking perfect. <laughs> Anyway, interesting fact. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty good with the heckler, but I mean, you know, you it's a it's a very fun thing. I think it's almost like it's it's a bit of the show people really enjoy because it feels very in the room. A very, I mean, occasionally we catch it on camera and it's fun to put out, but it's really the moments in the room. I believe you received a, a heckle or uh, interaction with an audience member where you essentially learned that you saved their life during a suicidal time when they were watching one of your compilations. Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, I mean, we've been, uh, I've been blessed that that's, that's, uh, that's maybe happened a few times. But yeah, really? I, I think the time that I talked about on Mike Babiglia's podcast was when a lady, uh, we, I get people to send me texts mm -hmm. and she sent this, this text. It was kind of a weirdly worded thing about the, I'm um, celebrating, you know, 13 years of extra life. Mm. The fuck does that mean? And then we got talking to her and it transpired that she was um, she was going to kill herself. She was going to hang herself. But she was waiting until everyone in the house had gone to sleep. So she was watching. She's filling some time. So she started watching YouTube. And somehow a video came up of um, uh, something that I'd done. I don't know what it was. And she laughed. And she re really liked it. And so she watched another. And then she watched another. And she kind of fell down a rabbit hole of watching tons of comedy. Um, lots of UK comedy and uh, and she didn't kill herself that night and then she's still around and that's a it's a lovely thing but I mean I think this is I think we talk about suicide nearly enough I think there's a there's a, there's a real kind of um, we don't think of it as being the symptom it's the symptom it's not the thing it's the symptom of a mental health crisis and the issue with it is that we don't talk about enough we should be telling young people this it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem it's it's yes you don't want to feel this anymore. But you don't want to feel nothing. Mm -hmm. And this too shall pass. This, this, this be gone. Like it's, it's, a, it's a perspective issue. I go, well, in five years' time, this will be forgotten. So it's, um, I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a strange thing to get a message like that and to uh, meet someone that you've, you've had uh, that sort of effect on. It's very uh, humbling, and uh, I don't quite know what to, to make of it. You just, you know, you're putting stuff out there, and you go, well, sometimes the people really need it. Sometimes people really need to laugh, and this is their this is your comedy's a uh, if you're going through hard times, it can really help because it just puts you in another state. And I can imagine this lady and the others that you've received messages from are the vocal few. There's probably an extrapolated amount of people who haven't reached out to you to tell you the exact same thing. Well, also they can't because they can't have. We don't know how many people kill themselves after watching one of my specials. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> that can't be zero, can it? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god of, of the many that are remaining though given the fact that if you could extrapolate that out if you were to really absorb that does that feel like a heavy weight to hold as a comedian no i i don't think i i can't process that i can't think about that that's like that's a that's crazy yeah. it's, it's, that's a it's a it's a it's a second order um uh outcome that you couldn't possibly predict that you know, you did a comedy special. Someone put it on YouTube. Da, ba, 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 da, 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 someone in a moment of crisis saw it, and uh, I guess it could have been any number of people that she saw, but somehow found a moment of joy in laughter in a very, very dark time. And you, you wish that everyone could have that. You wish that in those dark times that some somehow people could connect because it it is that connection. It's that that thing of going, oh, I laughed. It's a weird thing, comedy, because it's you're changing someone's state. Like there's a thousand people in a room, and you're you're changing their their physical state, and it's and what involuntary for them. Well, you're I'm a drug dealer, man. I'm dealing in drugs, and they'll never take me alive because you've got the drugs on you already. But serotonin and dopamine. So it's just it's a fucking speedball is what I'm delivering, right? And it's excellent because you don't quite know when the joke is happening, so. You get the dopamine hit of, in the same way as a, a scrolling Instagram or playing a, a roulette machine at the casino. You don't quite know what way it's going to go, and you're waiting for that hit. And actually, not getting the hit is the thing that keeps you coming back for more. So you don't quite know when the punch is coming in the joke. And then you're getting the serotonin, that feel-good hormone of, of, of laughter. So it's, it's really, and the, the, those two together, it's very powerful. It's almost like an ayahuasca ceremony because you're doing it with other people too. There's a shared experience. 
mm. and the room too. And there's something yeah, really beautiful about doing it. I mean, you, you laugh 30 times more when you're in a group with other people than when you're on your own. 30 times. It's a big number. People Why? don't laugh on their own. Why is that? We're tribal. It's a, um, if you think about where laughter goes back to, laughter predates language by about a million years. It's remote grooming. So there's a thing called the Dunbar number, which is about like silverback gorillas, right? They get to a group of about 60, and then the 65th guy goes, I don't even know these fuckers. I'm over here. And they start a new pod, right? So they, they go off and they form different groups. Now, the reason human beings were able to do so well was because we were able to have larger groups, which allows larger specialization. Well, how do we do that? Well, we did that through remote grooming. And remote grooming was about laughter. So you could show people that you weren't a threat, that you were part of the group, without needing necessarily to pick nits out of their hair. So that allowed a bigger group. So it's the social function of it is, uh, is incredibly important. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of information in one go there, sorry. Yeah. The, uh, but that's, that's our, as human beings, what's our big advantage? What do we do better than any other creature? It's cooperate. You put one guy in the jungle, you fed the animals. Put 100 guys in the jum- jungle, You've got a new apex predator. We're better together. And that thing of rewarding that, how do we reward that? Well, we, you know, laughter and, you know, what, do, what does it reward? It's, it's a sense of humor. Why have a sense of humor? Why do, why do you release dopamine when you hear a funny joke and serotonin? It's a reward, right? Well, it, it rewards uh, language, which is important for us, and pattern recognition, which is very important for us. Pattern recognition, everything's based on that. I love your concept of the superpowers of the average comedian. Yeah. What do you mean by that? And what are the superpowers? Well, again, pattern recognition is one of them. The idea that we're, we're incredibly good at spotting patterns and repeating them. If you think about a rule of three joke is the shortest pattern you could possibly get. It's the first two things. You think, you think it's going to go this way. It goes another way. The pattern's been disrupted. It's funny. It's, it's the, the aha and the ha-ha moment are very similar in life. And you become very good observationally. You become very good at using language, at getting ideas across in a succinct way. Um, that's really, we've got, there's a lot to recommend for, for the average comedian. It's, it's a good way to live your life. Do you expect your son to pick up the mic at least once? No, I, I wouldn't have thought. I would have thought that'd be, you know, <laughs> I mean, listen, you do whatever he wants. But uh, I, I think that's the, uh, it, it feels like that'd be a very difficult thing. <laughs> Depends. I mean, I might be entirely forgotten by the time he's 20. You know, it's that thing with comedy where you sort of go, well, I've reached a certain level. I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. But it's not. Comedy rots. You know, comedy gets, it, it improves so much. When you go back 30 years and watch like a, an old, old-timey old comedy special, the pace is pretty slow. It feels like we're, we're kind of, it's picked up a little bit now. Does that keep you on your toes? Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, you know. I, I, but I think most comics do their best work in their 50s. And you're 50... 51. 51. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm putting, the, putting the hours in, but I don't know anyone that... Uh, there's one guy that came out fully formed, but no one else has... Everyone else had to put the, the years in. Who came out fully formed? Eddie Murphy. The great... Eddie the great. Murphy, 18, came out fucking perfect. But, I mean, that's going to happen once in a generation. Are we in the gold rush of comedy at the moment? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's, there's never been a better time. I mean, really, when you look at... Uh, and Netflix has been a huge part of that, putting those specials out. Um, but really, YouTube has been huge for comedy. Um, clubs are doing great. The theatres around the world are fantastic. People want to come out and see it. I, you know, doing 45 countries on the tour, that's a lot. That's a lot of places. And it's a lot of places where other people don't go, but they will. You, as this podcast is released, your new special, Natural Born Killer, will be released. What should or could the audience expect of you, given the fact that you are in your greatest decade? Uh, well, I mean, it's better than the last one. And the last one was pretty funny. I mean, if it's the kind of thing you like, you'll enjoy it. If, if you like that kind of uh, sense of humor. But it's, um, I directed this one uh, with, uh, with Brian Klein. And uh, so it's got kind of, it's got, it's pretty interesting visually in terms of like, I think most stand-up comedy specials are just three shots on, on repeat. So this one's got a little bit more to it. It's, it's very nice tracking shots and it's cut to the rhythm of the joke. Um, and it feels to me like it's like the attention to detail is there. There's sort of beautiful lighting changes for each sequence. There's a bit at the end of the show where I give a young man advice on uh, the facts of life and consent and we have the talk 
that's pretty fun and gets a message across. There's a nice bit about being a father where there's a few moments where I open up and share a little bit more about my life than I than I have in the past. So it, it feels like it's um, a progression. It feels like it's uh, I'm growing as a performer. So I've got the fastball still. I've got that. You know, I can do the one-liners and then I'm trying to experiment with doing other things and trying to do them well. So it feels like there's a bit of growth there. Do you have an image of what self-actualization looks like for Jimmy Carr? Um, I mean, this is it, isn't it? It's the process. It's the process. It's not like something you get to. It's not the journey or the destination. It's who you become on the journey. So this is it. You must enjoy the process, not what the process buys you. No. This podcast uses origin stories as self-development tool. I've got to hear yours. If you were to use one of, if you were to share one of the tools from your story that you've learned as a unanimous pill or unanimous tool for our younger audience to grab a hold of and take forward, what, so what does that come to mind? What, the greatest lesson? The, the, I mean... From your own story. It's hard to pick, it's, it's kind of hard to pick one. I mean, I suppose prioritize later would be the, the axiom that sums it all up of like the, you know, work for the future. And it's, it's that thing where you go, I, su I suppose it's that thing where you go, hard work and discipline give you freedom. And I think it's hard to get that when you're young. It's hard to get that idea that freedom comes from uh, the discipline. But the, the idea that it's the, your, your systems are going to be what really makes the difference, what you do every day. How you do anything is how you do everything. What's next for Jimmy Carr? I'm going to try and teach. I mean, I've got the new tool. I'll do that. I'll be pretty stoic um, on stand-up. I'll write that. I'll do a little bit of TV as a side hustle. But, you know, you've got to be... I think you have to be slightly detached from that in terms of ego because at some stage people go, oh, yeah, we're not hiring you anymore. Great, okay. I had a great run. Um, and then touring the world, all that, you know. Uh, and I've written this book with, with a man, which I think is pretty good. Uh, in terms of music has a language. So it's pretty easy for a musician from Nigeria to talk to a musician from Tokyo and they've got a shared language and they can they can play along together. And comedians don't really have that language. So there's a lot of magical thinking in my business. There's a lot of people sort of that are sort of go, well, I just get on stage and it just comes to me and it flows and uh, and it's um it's 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 bullshit. You you don't need to think like that. There's a craft and you don't need to think that it doesn't it won't spoil that part of it, the 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 inspiration part, to know how it works and to know how to deconstruct it and to know how to to, to write it. Um, I think that's, I don't know, I think it'd be a, that'd be a lovely thing, be a lovely way to say thank you, to demonstrate and practice gratitude for all that it's given me, give a little something back. And, you know, I'd also become a fucking legend. <laughs> so there's that. Jimmy Carlos, you've been amazing. Thank you for coming to the podcast. Yeah, no, it was very good of me. <laughs>